Thank you so much for joining us for this Black Hills Information Security webcast. It is on stopping attacks with cookies, not stop eating cookies with attack. It, it's stopping attacks with cookies, and it's not the eating kind of cookies. Uh, we got BB here today, and BB is going to teach this. Now, if you ever need a red team threat hunt, pen test, active sock, or anything like that, you know where to find us. Uh, or if you ever need training, you can always take it from anti siphon training. But with that, BB, it's all yours. Thank you, Jason. Yes, we're going to talk about stopping attacks with cookies. And when you make a title, it's supposed to be kind of short. And I kind of like this one because um, are we stopping attacks with cookies or are we stopping attacks by using cookies? By the time we're done, you'll understand. It'll make sense at the end. So here's what we're going to cover. We're going to cover HTTP cookies and their options. Did you know that they were originally called magic cookies? They were, they're not magic anymore. They're just cookies now. Uh, we're gonna talk about cross-site request forgery and the reason that cross-site request forgery exists is because of cookies. Uh, we'll look very briefly at how to traditionally solve CSRF uh, problems. And then we're gonna look at some new cookie flags that can help mitigate CSRF in addition to what you're already doing ideally. And then of course, because everyone wants to know about APIs, we'll talk about how this um, fits in with APIs. And as I mentioned before we started, I do have a uh, pen testing class about web apps. Um, it's online, on demand, anytime you want to do it. I'm doing it live next week. Here's a few more times it's happening. There's a QR code you can scan if you want to and a short URL. That's all I'm going to say about that. Um, in the class and in my life, I believe that there's a no, there is a difference. There's a difference between theory and practice. And practicing things, doing things is how you actually learn stuff. Um, sometimes the theory and the practice are very similar, but sometimes they're different. And getting hands-on and digging deep into things is how you can make sense of the theory so that you don't have to remember every single special case. If you know in general how something works, when you come across a new situation, new technology, uh, you can apply that knowledge. You don't have to memorize how it is in this one. You just go back to kind of first principles and things will start to make sense. So first principles, we're gonna talk about cookies briefly. We all know what cookies are, right? They're those things in your web browser that keep track of stuff. Um, we have that because HTTP is a stateless protocol. So each request in HTTP is completely independent of every other request. So the only way to keep track of an individual uh, browser or an individual user from request to request is to tack something on top of HTTP. And that's usually cookies. So the website sets a cookie in your browser. Uh, it recognizes you. Maybe you log in, give it username and password, and then you get a cookie in response. And then every time your browser sends a request to that site in the future, it includes that cookie. So the server can say, oh, that's BB again. I'm going to show him his stuff, right? That makes sense. You understand how that works. Um, cookies are not the only place that you can store information in the browser. There's also DOM storage, which is usually called local storage. Um, local storage is one of the two. Local storage and session storage are both DOM storage. Uh, the difference between the two is that uh, session storage gets deleted when you close the browser, and local storage persists uh, every time you restart the browser, close the browser, restart the browser. It's all going to be there still. A uh, little bit of difference between the two of them. They, um, they're both subject to the same origin policy, which means very basically, it means that um, the site that set the cookie is the only site that can see the cookie. That's basically what same origin policy means. Uh, you can have cookies that are good for um, uh, persistent, and that means that there's a, an expiration date on the cookie, or a session cookie, which means there is no expiration date on the cookie, which is implied to mean hey, browser, delete this when your process ends. When you close, don't keep this across restarting of the browser. DOM storage, same thing. Local storage is uh, persistent storage, and session storage is session storage. The big thing that's nice about DOM storage is that there's more room. <clears throat> you can store up to five megabytes per origin. So origin is basically a website. So each website can have up to five megabytes of space in local storage and another five in session storage. So 10 megabytes, that's like a whole box of floppy disks uh, that each website can store on your web browser. Whereas with cookies, it's a little bit fuzzy. Uh, it's about four kilobytes per cookie, which if you think about it, is a very long cookie um, and about 20 cookies per origin. So not as much in total and they have to be smaller chunks all that kind of stuff. The key here, though, the interesting thing here is, is one of these phrases that we like to use. Web developers, I think in particular, like to make up words that are confusing, and they put words together that mean one thing in one context and something else in a different context, and they've done it here. So there's this concept called ambient authority. <laughs> it makes sense. Ambient 
Uh, the words actually, this one actually makes some sense. Ambient is just like things that are around, right? The ambient air, how, how warm is the ambient air? There's ambient noise going around. Maybe my microphone's picking up some of that. Ambient just means it's part of the environment. It's not something you're actively paying attention to. It just happens. It's just something that's there you can't get away from. And authority in this case doesn't mean like enforcing rules. It means um, who are you? It means authentication really. So uh, who are you and what are you allowed to do? And the way that this is ambient in cookies, I'll get to in a second. Uh, but the key is that DOM storage is not like that. DOM storage has to be explicitly uh, set and gotten out of DOM storage for it to work. So you have to have a JavaScript somewhere that is reading and writing that DOM storage. And because it's subject to the same origin policy, that JavaScript has to come from the same site or the same location that created the thing to begin with. So the ambient authority, I'm going to go into this a little bit more because this is why CSRF works. Uh, every time you visit a site that has set a cookie in your browser, your browser sends that cookie back to the site every single time. It's changing. But every single time, that's how they started. That's, that's what a cookie is. That's what it's for. That's why they're so convenient because once it is set, you don't have to ask for it again. It just comes on every request to the server. And if you're the web developer and you need to know what that cookie is, it's right there. You don't have to ask for it. And if you don't need the cookie for a particular thing, you can just ignore it. It's safe. So the downside of this is like the same downside that you have with Face ID on your phone. I hate Face ID on my phone. I want the thumb thing to come back. Because uh, when I look to see what time it is, it unlocks my phone. That's not what I wanted. Why did it unlock? Because the ambient authority. When I look at my phone, I have no choice but to look with my face. And my face is what unlocks the phone. So this is exactly what's going on with CSRF. Um, I, I want to see what time it is, but my phone unlocks itself. It's doing something I didn't expect it to do, something I didn't ask it to do, just because of this thing called ambient authority. So let's look at cross-site request forgery. Some of you know this stuff. Some of you, um, I think maybe not so much. So we're gonna spend a little bit of time on cross-site request forgery so you understand what we're talking about so that the cookie flags and stuff we're gonna talk about in the future makes some sense. So CSRF or CSRF, uh, cross-site request forgery, is, is exactly this. It is causing an action to happen on some site based on a request, request triggered from another site. That's what the cross-site part means. Um, the attacks for these are usually, we illustrate them with a, a broken image tag, which I'll show you on the next slide. Uh, the request doesn't need to make sense in context of the HTML. It just needs to be something that the browser is going to send. You have to somehow, as the attacker, uh, create a document that the browser is going to read and parse and send the request that you want it to send to the system that you want it to send it to. That's what CSRF is. It works because of that ambient authority. The browser sends the cookie, which is basically saying that you're logged in, right? It's how you identify who you are to that site. If that cookie goes with the request, that's an authenticated request. So if the attacker gets everything else right, your browser supplies the cookie, and then it just works. That's just how it works. It's just, it just, it works. OWASP, I love OWASP. If you don't know about OWASP and you do anything with web apps, you should learn a little bit about OWASP. They're fantastic. They have great resources, very good checklists, very good uh, testing rules, very good resources to learn about how to test web apps and how to develop them more securely. So I always go there for my examples because uh, they're great. They save me time. <laughs> so this is the canonical illustration that we use for cross-site request forgery. It's always money, right? Everyone understands money. Everyone understands transferring money. So there's a request here that transfers money to Bob's account, and it gives him $100. If this is how your bank site is set up, you have a bad bank. Uh, because this kind of request, they go on to show you how this could be exploited. If you wanted to send money to Bob, Maria might get your money instead. So Maria could make a URL that looks almost exactly the same, except she puts her name in here and she puts, uh, what is that? $1,000 or $100,000. I don't know where the decimal point is. Uh, and if she puts this in a site somewhere, maybe she's got a blog and she posts a picture uh, and she says, hey, look at my pictures. And here's the link. If you click on this link, you'll see my pictures. And if you click on that link, you won't see her pictures. You'll go to your bank and you'll transfer $100,000 to her. You might notice right away, but it's already happened. And this requires you to actually click. She could also do it this way. She could uh, have an image tag 
uh, which is uh, it's a replaced element in HTML. So this doesn't get rendered as is. It, the image tag looks for whatever is at this source URL, and it tries to put it in the page. That's how images show up. And this says width zero, height zero, so it doesn't take up any space on the site. And you're not going to get an image in response to this, right? But it doesn't matter. All that matters is that the browser sends the request. So these two requests are the same thing. And uh, with traditional cookies, both of those would work. Both of those would send that same request to transfer to Maria $100,000 with your authentication token if you're logged in, obviously. So here we have to click. Here the browser helps. But actually, in both cases, the browser helps because the browser supplies that thing that is necessary, which is the authentication token, which is the cookie, which is what you get after you log in. So that is cross-site request forgery. An attacker, the attacker's job here is they have to cause a valid authenticated request, right? They have to create a request that's going to do something on the server. It's important to note on the side here that the, um, the attacker never gets to see the response to this. Uh, they, they, they just don't get to see the response. That's how that works. Uh, so all they can do is send the request. So the only interesting requests for cross-site request forgery are requests that make a change on the server or that put money in your bank account, right? That's, that's cool too. So they have to, the attacker has to be able to predict the values of all the parameters. So the name of the account to go to the dollar amount and whether there's a decimal point in there or not, all those things have to be correct for the web server to accept it uh, because that's how the web server was coded and it expects to see certain things. So once they've got all those parameters uh, defined and correct, now they have to get somebody who's logged in, so someone who has a session cookie, uh, to visit that link. Uh, they don't need to know the value of the session cookie. This is the key. The browser sends that cookie all the time, ambient authority. It's always there. So the attacker doesn't need to know what it is. It could be the most securely random generated thing you'll never guess in the world. It doesn't matter because the browser is going to send it automatically, ambient authority. So that's their job. The, uh, the defender's job is to try to make this harder. So the easiest thing to make harder is make it harder for them to predict the values of all of those parameters. The most common response, the most common way of doing this is to require an unpredictable input along with everything else. Now, people will say a random input. And no, random doesn't matter. Random can help, but unpredictable is what counts, right? There's the XKCD thing. Four could be a random number. Pick a random number between one and two. Well, okay, a random integer between one and three, right? It's random, but it's always gonna be two. So what happens in this case is the request gets sent, but because the attacker couldn't figure out what your unpredictable value was, the, um, the server refuses to process that transaction. Not because you weren't logged in, but because there was something wrong with your request. It's like you're going to the bank and you're trying to withdraw money from your account. <clears throat> <clears throat> and like somebody said in the chat, like Char said in the chat, maybe you don't have $100,000 and you filled out the deposit slip to remove $100,000. And the bank says, oh, you know, I would love to give you $100,000, but you don't have that much money in your account. That's worse. I would rather them say, you know what? That's not your account. I'm not even going to look at it for you. That would be better, right? It would. So there's new cookie flags. Cookies are constantly evolving. It's shocking how rapidly <laughs> they're evolving. Um, there, are, there are flags on your cookie. So when the server sets a cookie, it gives it a name and a value. So you know, J session ID equals this long, random, <laughs> unpredictable string or something like that. There's a name and a value. In addition to those things, there are other flags and parameters you can put on the cookie. There's one called expires. There's one called max age. And this tells the browser when to delete the cookie. So this limits when the exposure, when, when the cookie will be exposed or used by the browser, limits it in time. Uh, there's a path parameter that you can put a path on the server in. You can put just a slash, and that means everything on the server. You could say, you know, just, just under slash admin, so only send this cookie if the URL you're requesting starts with slash admin. So this will limit the exposure of that cookie within a specific server. Uh, there's the secure flag that says, hey, browser, only send this cookie if the protocol is HTTPS. Uh, there's... I'll come back to HTTP only. There's the domain. So you can set, you can say which domain this cookie is good for. And that sounds really exciting until you realize that you don't have complete freedom there as the developer. Uh, you can only make it more, um, not more restrictive. You can, you can make it less restrictive, but only to the second level domain. So wouldn't it be awesome if you could set a cookie for .com and it would be included with every request to every .com server? That would be so awesome, you're not allowed to do it. Uh, so you can only do it to the second level domain. Uh, so that would be like bhis.com. 
and the um that's not us actually bhis.com so you could have it work for you know www.yoursite or api.yoursite or nothing your site.com you can do that so that that cookie is available to all the subdomains that you have defined so this increases the exposure within an organization because if you don't set this then the scope is implied to be whatever the fully qualified domain name was of the site that set the cookie to begin with so this makes the cookie a little bit uh, broader makes it used in more situations and then HTTP only is different from these other ones. What this one does is it, it, it tells the browser to hide this cookie from your JavaScript engine. Uh, don't let the job only use it in HTTP. Don't let JavaScript or, um, or VB script or even Python. Now you could run Python in your browser. Um, this would prevent those scripts from seeing that cookie. And the last thing, what I really want to talk about is the same site parameter. So the same site parameter uh, limits the exposure by the initiator, by who is it that's causing this request to happen. Uh, there are three potential values for this. One is strict, which means only send this cookie to me if I am the one that created the resource that's causing the request. So if you're on my site, always send me that cookie. If you're coming to me from another site, if somebody has a bookmark or something, don't send me cookies. If, um, uh, if, uh, I guess that's it. If they're coming from another site, I don't want to see the cookies. There's none, which means to always send the cookie, which is always confusing. And I always have a hard time remembering that none means always. None means always. So none means we're disabling the same site parameter, basically. And that gets us back to the previous behavior we had without this parameter. And then lax is in the middle. Lax means sometimes send it. Other times don't send it. I'll get into what that means soon. Here's what the set cookie header looks like in the wild. So this was me uh, yesterday. I went to wordpress.com because WordPress amazes me that they have been able to take over the whole internet, um, most of the internet. 30, 40%, I think, of the sites on the internet run WordPress. It's true. It's a thing that is real. So I went there because it's an easy place to go and they set some cookies. Here's a set cookie header in the response when I just go to wordpress.com slash. I get this cookie, here's a name, here's the value, and here's a bunch of other stuff. It's hard to read. So let me parse it out for you. Here's the set cookie header. There's the name, uh, TK underscore AI, and then the value in the... And then there's expires and max age. Those are both the same thing. Max age is the number of seconds from now. Uh, and in this case, it was the same thing, 14 days, I think. Here's the path parameter with slash. Here's the domain dot wordpress.com. So this cookie is going to be sent to any subdomain of wordpress.com, but only if it's a secure connection, only if it's HTTPS. And then they have same site equals none. So they've disabled the same site parameter, basically. So this means this is the traditional cookie. It's going to be sent every single time, every request I ever send to anything that ends with wordpress.com uh, for at least the next two weeks, this cookie will be included. So that's what it looks like when it creates the cookie. When the cookie is used, it's different. And I've seen people be confused about this. And that's why this slide exists. This is what a cookie looks like in a request, that exact same cookie. In a request, all you get is the name and the value. You don't get the other flags. So looking at a request, you cannot tell what those other parameters are. You can't tell if the secure flag was set. You can't tell if HTTP only was set. None of those things apply. Those are instructions for the browser on how to treat the cookie. They're not properties of the cookie itself, the way I look at it. They're like metadata about the cookie. So in the request, so if you're looking to see if someone's setting the correct flags on their cookie, you have to look at the set cookie header. You can't look at the use of the cookie. Um, it just doesn't show up there because that's not how it's meant to work. So those are the cookies and those are the CSRF. So does CSRF require authentication? Does it require that somebody be logged in for it to work? Um, and yes, it does. Um, and then the caveat, of course, if you have other problems, if you're not enforcing authentication in the first place, well, then yes, CSRF could cause problems without someone being logged in. But that's different, right? The whole thing, the, the singular value in CSRF is that the browser sends a request that includes your authentication token. That's, that's why it's interesting. So it requires authentication. Does it require cookies? Can you do authentication in a different way? You could store them in local storage. You could do other things. You could use a custom HTTP request header. You could use the authorization header. There are other ways you can do authentication. So it pretty much does require cookies. Cookies are the only thing that, uh, that has that ambient authority that are always sent with every request. Always sent 
with every request. I'm lying to you a little bit. Uh, in, in Firefox, they have this feature called total cookie protection, which sounds pretty awesome, right? And this little diagram they have is a very good illustration of how that works. In Firefox today, uh, this is, when did they, they enabled this like a month ago? Uh, it was, it's been available as a, a test feature. You had to specifically enable it for like a year or so, but I think it's enabled now by default in Firefox. And it basically makes every cookie a same site strict cookie. Uh, the cookies that get sent to Facebook are only the cookies that were, that were created by Facebook. If you go to another site and there's a Facebook resource that you have to get, it's not going to send the cookie with that. So it's protecting you. It's, it's helping you out here. And I, I mention this because it's important to know as a tester, because if you're looking to make a proof of concept uh, exploit for something here, you have to know how your browser behaves. I don't think it's wise to rely on this feature because not every browser does this. Uh, people can disable them. You have some responsibility as a developer, I think, to be safe and not to trust other people to not make mistakes. Uh, so you should be developing securely to begin with, but it's good to know that Firefox kind of has your back here. Firefox has this big anti-tracking thing going on. They have this uh, total cookie protection. They also have um, containers, which is kind of what this is built on. Uh, containers mean you can group different domains together and only those things in that container can see each other or can send requests to each other. Really kind of neat what they're doing. But from the standpoint of a pen tester, also kind of irrelevant because I can't control what browser people use. Um, all we can do is we can help the developers control what their... Um, what their web apps do. So that's the theory, right? That's the, 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 the lecture part. Now we're going to do a little demonstration to show you how this works in practice. And I'm going to have to look at my other monitor. So forgive me for not looking at you, but don't look at me, look at my screen here. So I have a, um, uh, a page here, a web page that I made by myself. Uh, and this is simulating uh, what an attacker might do. Uh, it's just a place to show you how these different types of requests uh, do different things with the same cookies. Uh, so first, I'm going to go to WordPress, and I'm going to just load the WordPress page. And then I'm going to go to blackhillsinfosec.com, and I'm just going to load the BHIS page. And then I'm going to go back here. And I did that because I have links in here that point to one or both of those places. And now I'm going to reload this page after I've visited those. So just reloading this page, I have, so here's a link to the BHIS blog. There is a, um, uh, that's all I have is a link to click on for the BHIS blog. And then for, for WordPress, I have a couple of things in here. I have a, a link that you can click on to go to the WordPress blog. I have an embedded link here that loads a script from WordPress.com. So this is different. It's not clicking. It's just as part of the rendering. And then here I have another one. And this is like the CSRF attack that we saw earlier. This is a, an image tag that points to nothing, but that nothing happens to be on WordPress.com. So that request might include cookies. That's what I've got in here. So when I, when I load this page, you can see in the console, it's already complaining about cookies. Cookie one, two, three with same site attribute value lacks or strict was omitted because of a cross-site redirect. So it was trying to load this cookie or trying to use that cookie, but it left it out because of that same site parameter. Uh, same thing here. There are several cookies here that would have been sent, but for the way the same site parameter is set on that cookie. Now I'm going to go into burp and here's my history. And one of my burp tricks is whenever I'm going to send something new, I try to mark my place. So that's the most recent request before I did anything. And now I'm going to click on, we're going to intercept. Um, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. First, I'm going to look at the BHIS homepage. I'm going to look at the cookies that exist for the BHIS homepage. And there are four of them and they all have the same site parameter set to none. So every cookie that we give you on our blog is treated as if it was an old cookie. So it's always going to show up. And this makes sense uh, if you think about it, because these are the Google Analytics um, things. So we're, we're watching you and we want to see which blog posts that you're reading so that we can write more like that. And we want to see which ones you're not reading so we can fix them. Uh, this is So you want these cookies as a site operator, you want these cookies to be present as much as possible. 
So all set to none. So that means I think, right? They should all, they should all be sent if I click on this link. So if I click on BHIS blog, here we've got these requests, here are the cookies. And if you look at, it's kind of, they kind of get smashed together. It's not really easy to tell how many are there right away. Uh, but if you look at the inspector, request cookies, there's three. All right, weren't there four? One, two, three, four. Let's see, did this one expire Thursday? Nope, that one didn't expire. I'm uh, not sure why that one's not there. But you can see they, there's one, two, three, four. I don't know why it's not there. Firefox does some things that I haven't quite figured out how to disable all of them yet. But that's what we get. So none, you get all the cookies. If we go back to my little site, Sorry about that. And bring up developer tools again, network and the console, and let's make them big enough so you can see them. And now we're going to click on this WordPress JavaScript file. So this is a link to the WordPress JavaScript file. If you look at the WordPress site, they have, they have a lot more cookies. <laughs> they do a lot more with cookies than we do. And if you sort them here by same site parameter, you see there's some lax and there's some none, there's no strict. Yesterday, there were a couple that were strict. If I click on this and come back in here and mark my place, if I click on the WordPress JS file, here's my request. And here are all the cookies that it included. There are 26 cookies. We're not going to go through all of those cookies. If we go back here, and reload this, we'll see now there are more cookies. Look at all those cookies. So that's what happens when I click on a link to visit this thing. I get all of these. And now I'm gonna take this here and I'm gonna send this to Comparer because I'm gonna do something different. A, different. a different kind of request that your browser might send is when it's rendering a page here. So in this one, if you look at the view source, you see here that link was to this Bilmer JavaScript file. Down here, this is that same file, but it's using it as part of the content of the page, not, not a click that somebody has to click on, but part of the content. So if I mark this now here, just as where I was, and if I come back to this and reload it, you'll see here's that request again. And the request cookies, there's 22 now. So if I send this to Comparer and then go to Comparer and I compare the words in those last two things and do sync views, you'll see here's this is one that just has a different value. But if I keep scrolling over to the right, you'll see here's a whole cookie that was deleted. It was in one request, but not the other. And here's another that was in one request, but not the other. That's what you're seeing there is that same site parameter saying only send the cookie in this context, but not that context. Cool. And the difference there is in one case I clicked and the other case, I just, my browser just rendered the page. I have this saved in repeater to show it a little bit easier what's going on here. So this is the one where it loaded the file into, it loaded this JavaScript file into the file I was looking at. This is not the click. And you'll see there are, you know, 22 request cookies. And look here, you've got this sec-fetch-something. So this is uh, fetching a script. Uh, mode is not with cores and site is cross-site. If I look at the other one where I clicked, dest is document, not script. Fetch mode is navigate not no cores, still cross site. And this one says sec fetch user equals question mark one. Question mark one is the only value that ever shows up here. And this means user did the thing, user clicked. This is how the server knows what to expect, how this, the context that this uh, request is coming in. So whether it should honor it or not. So in this case, I'm trying to get a document. In this case, I'm trying to get a script. 
So the browser might treat a script differently than a document, right? A script, it might try to execute. A document, it might try to display. Same URL, different context, different intended use, different behavior. Is that making sense? You can see those little differences there. All right. Uh, well, this last thing here, this is, um, this is the RFC for cookies. Uh, and this is it being updated. This is not the published version. This is a draft version. And here they're talking about the same site attribute, which is what we just covered. And if you look at this, um, it was published a week ago. Cookies are new. So there was my demo. And in the slides, I have instructions how you can follow along with that at home. So if you didn't see what I was saying, it didn't make sense to you, you saw something different, um, you can do it at home yourself and see what's going on as uh, on your own system. And this is just that same page as well. So this new same site parameter allows um, your browser to decide when it's going to send that cookie and when it's not going to send that cookie. And omitting the cookie altogether as a defense against um, forged request is, I think, way better than relying on the, um, the attacker's inability to predict all the values that need to go along with that request. Um, the outcome might be the same, but philosophically, I, I want if someone goes to take money out of my bank account, I want them to fail because they're not me. I don't want them to fail because they asked wrong, right? And that's what this is. This gives you a chance to say, you're not even logged in. I don't have any idea who you are. I don't even know which account to look in. So no, rather than, oh, I would, but there's a mistake. So this is... CSRF and defenses in a web browser. Now, what about APIs? People like to ask about APIs. What's different about testing APIs than testing web browsers? This is why I spent so much time earlier on talking about how cookies work and how the browser works and that ambient authority and all those things. So Arthur Ashe, tennis player from the 70s, is one of my favorite people because of this. He says, start where you are, use what you have, and do what you can. You know something. You can always move forward from where you are, no matter where you are. You don't have to be an expert at the beginning, but you're someplace you can move forward from. So the other thing about this is the, the sports. I'm not a big sports fan, but I love the sports analogy here. Whenever a team is having a bad season or a couple of bad seasons, what do they do? They fire the coach, right? And then they hire a new coach. And what does the new coach say? The new coach always says, the way we're going to get this team back in shape is we're going to focus on the fundamentals. We're going to focus on just relentless execution of the fundamentals. So if you know if it's a football team, they're going to, we're going to work on you know blocking and tackling, or we're going to work on uh, kicking field goals, all those things. We're not going to spend time on trick plays. We're not going to spend time on the you know the fifty yard passes. We're not going to spend time on you know laterals and and, and reverses and, and tricky plays and things like that. No, we're going to focus on the fundamentals because that's what really counts. Once you get those done. That might be enough. And if it's not, you've got a strong basis to build on. So it's as, as with football, so with web app pen testing. <laughs> Relentless execution of the fundamentals will get you there. So think about what you know and apply that to what you don't yet know. And that will lead you towards some more knowledge. So try to puzzle this out. Think about what you know about CSRF in the browser and think about what you know about APIs. And the thing I'll tell you about APIs is they don't often authenticate with a cookie. So CSRF requires actions by the browser. It requires the browser to send that cookie. Um, it requires the browser to send requests that are hidden from the user during the rendering stage. Uh, there, it's better that way. Um, so the image tag that actually tries to transfer money rather than load an image. And the browser sends cookies with every request. APIs don't use a browser. Then you're saying, well, yes, they do. No, they don't. <laughs> they, they use part of the browser. The, uh, the API, a web application that's based on APIs is all done on the client side. It's all JavaScript in the client side, JavaScript written by the developers. And the requests and responses are objects. They're not documents. Well, maybe they are documents, JSON documents, but it's not something you would render in a page. It's just data. And you need JavaScript in the client to render that and make any sense out of it. The part of the browser 
that causes those CSRF requests to happen when you have an image tag in there, for example, is the renderer. The renderer looks and says, oh, there's an image tag. I need to go get that so I can make a pretty picture for you. Uh, the APIs don't do that. The response is just going to, it's going to be JSON. It's going to be XML. It's not going to be something the browser processes further. It's something that will be processed further by JavaScript in the browser that the developers have written, not that's part of the browser. Do you see how that's different? There, it's it's not using the browser because you can use APIs without a browser at all, right? So it's not calling a particular part that's instrumental in the normal exploitation of this. So what do you think? Can you can you CSRF an API endpoint if the if the authentication token is not in a cookie, if it's not rendering anything? I argue no, you can't. Uh, here's an example from uh, the Twitter API documents. Uh, this is how you would delete a tweet. You need the tweet's ID number, and then you just send a delete request to the URL that points to that tweet. And then you have to include a header called authorization. And in the authorization header, you have to include the word OAuth and then a space, and then the OAuth signature, if that's how you've logged in uh, for this API session. Nothing ambient about this. If the attacker wants to send this, they can send it, but they have to know what your OAuth signature is. And that's kind of a secret, right? They're not supposed to be able to get at that. So there's nothing ambient about this. This is not just going to just happen on its own. Even if I even if I had a link that pointed to this tweet ID and I got somebody who's logged in who owns that tweet to visit my page with that link embedded in it, it's not going to happen because the browser is not going to send a delete request in response to browsing anything or, or rendering anything. And um, and and that's the, and that's that's how those work. That's if it's just part of the rendering process, it's just it's just not going to happen. So the problem with that request is that there's there's no cookie, and that's where the ambient authority is. So it's not going to happen. And also we have cores, we have uh, cross origin resource sharing, which uh, should also stop those things to happen. Uh, CSRF, I'm sorry, cores is um, another protection that's built in. Uh, for when you're using JavaScript. If you're not just having an HTML tag that's an image tag, if you want to make a request with JavaScript, those requests are subject to the cross-origin resource sharing policy. And hopefully that would get in the way to stop you, unless there's a problem with that too, which there sometimes is on APIs. Sometimes the course policy is too wide open. So can you CSRF an API endpoint? Sometimes you can, and here's how what would have to happen for that to work. You'd have to find a web app that uses the API uh, because you, you need a victim, right? You need somebody who's logged in using their web browser to the site that you're going after. You have to find cross-site scripting in that web app uh, because you have to write a script to, uh, to find the token and put it in the right place and send it. Uh, you might find that token in local storage, which OWASP has a lot to say about that. Uh, it's a bad place to store tokens because even though it's subject to the same origin policy, that's the first place anyone's going to look once they get cross-site scripting to go. They're going to look in local storage and session storage and see if they can find some tokens in there. So you'd write a cross-site scripting payload that gets that token, and then you would send a request that includes that token, just like on the previous page there with the, the Twitter thing. You would have the authorization header and you would embed that token in there. And then you would have to hope also that cores doesn't block you, that somehow there's a problem with the cores policy that allows you to do that. And so you could make this happen, but it's not really CSRF anymore, is it? It's, it's a lot more involved. It's not the same thing. So do you see how they're different? Hopefully, this has given you enough to go on. You understand how CSRF works now. You understand how cookie flags can limit the exposure of the cookies, and that is the key to limiting the vulnerability or the exploitability of a CSRF problem. And if you're using APIs, it might be different. One more thing I want to show you, full disclosure here. Um, in Firefox, they keep changing things. Like in the time, from the time that I started preparing this to, the, to today, they changed this. This um, standard protection here is the standard, it's the default. And it blocks the following. It blocks cross-site cookies in all windows. Whoops. So this wouldn't have worked. It worked when I put it together. It didn't work this morning. I had to redo these to make it work uh, because of a change that got added to Firefox very recently. So custom, I had to say, you know, don't block cookies because I want to show people what I want to show them. And um, 
that's a real thing. So while you're testing, if you're a pen tester and you find cross-site request forgery, uh, you find the symptoms of cross-site request forgery, which is I can predict all the values and um, my session ID is stored in a cookie and that cookie might not be adequately protected. You need to take the next step. You need to try to exploit it because there might be controls in the browser that block it. And it might be a control that's only in your browser. It might be an optional type thing. So understanding how these things actually work and what you should expect to see is critical if you want people to trust you and believe what you're saying about what's vulnerable and what's not and what's a good resolution and what's not. So that is the end. And this is probably the first time I think I've ever not been rushed at the end of one of my talks here. So I'm kind of happy about that. Uh, if you like this, the, like this approach to things and you're interested in web app pen testing, uh, I do a lot more like this in the modern web app pen testing class uh, on demand online anytime. Next week online, uh, September 7th, I'll be in Louisville, Kentucky at Hack Redcon giving the talk or the, the class. I'll be at Wildless Hacking Fest in October. Uh, there might be another one around Columbus I'm working at that might be here in November that I might be teaching at. Uh, that QR code, you can trust me. It'll take you there. Any questions? I remember the first time I saw emojis in Zoom and I was like, am I really seeing that? And then John saw it one day and he's like, what is that? The emojis is this real? in Zoom. Is that a yeah. thing? Yeah, there's tons of emojis coming in. There's thumbs up, there's shock face, hearts, all that stuff. I don't know if you get to see it. I see it. Am I, I missing Maybe, something? Maybe. Wait, is no one else seeing it? I, oh, look. Hey, there they are. Now oh, I see it. Okay. Oh, oh. Thank you. That's that's nice. No, when I'm presenting it, I didn't see that screen at all. Thanks. Yeah. Look at all those. Wow. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So we got a lot of room for activities, meaning questions. Uh, so I'll get started with the first one. Would zero trust mitigate against this? Zero trust. Um, so zero trust, I, it depends on how the cookie is set. So, so zero trust is a way to authenticate. And if they, um, if they keep that authentication token in a cookie that's not well protected, uh, then yes, it would, be, it would be vulnerable to these things. So no, I guess is the answer to the question. Would it protect? No, not mm -hmm. in and of itself. Uh, this is a, I believe, a personal question, but I can answer it. Uh, for everyone. So does, does BHIS offer skill bridge? And skill bridge is that transition period from the military into civilian life. And the answer is yes. Uh, do you believe we were approved for that? So you would have to go through the contact us form. Uh, will there be a recording available? Absolutely. It's always available on YouTube, uh, youtube.com slash Black Hills Information Security. So you can go there. Uh, John Rooney's Why uh, YouTube video, always check for the hidden API when web scraping. I think that's uh, something there. Uh, if anyone else has any questions, uh, everyone always told me I was just a jerk, but I was just living the zero trust life, I guess. So. <laughs> no, zero trust is cool, but it's, um, you, you got to understand what's going on there as well. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not, the, it's not a panacea, right? It's not a silver bullet. There's never anything like that. Yeah. Oh, there was a good one. Uh, Nappy Cap asked is that uh, you could chain cross-site scripting with CSRF. Mm -hmm. Would that make the impact on a bug bounty higher? Mm -hmm. Um, Yes, people will tell you that the attack that you want when you get cross-site scripting is cross-site request forgery. Uh, the uh, a site that defends itself against CSRF with the traditional thing having you know an unpredictable value along with all the form submissions. If you get cross-site scripting, you can run a script so you can parse through the response and you can pull out that token and now you can include the correct token in your requests and you can do the forgery so now you can do things in the application that your targeted user could do you could if you can add a new user if you can change the password if you can transfer money anything that user could do you could do yourself so yes if you ever find cross-site scripting don't stop there especially if it's a bug bounty you want to look for a vulnerable thing that that user could do inside that application and try to cause that to happen with your with with your script and if you can use it to bypass CSRF, that's even cooler. So I would expect that, yes, the payout for that would increase substantially if you could make that happen. Yeah, there was a, my daughter's friend fell victim to an attack on Discord that was tied to Roblox or Roblox or I don't know, yeah. uh, where the attacker was able to gain access to the Roblox character. And then they just would meet up with another person inside the Roblox world and just clear out the inventory of that character. So they would just give all the things from their backpack to the other person and that person would just disappear and then you'd get your account back. But now you have nothing left in your inventory. And it was sad. Like yeah. those kids spent a lot of money on those things. 
that's weird. It is. That, that's, that's why I do this. It, it's because there are jerks out there that like to screw up kids' games. And I would like to make the games less susceptible to that so the jerks can have to go do something else instead. I mean, mm. it's funny to do those things, but in, until you realize that you're actually screwing somebody up, then it's mm. not funny anymore. Yeah. Uh, we need to work on that kid's book on how kids cannot get scammed on the internet. Yeah. So. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, Maho said, I took the class in 2021. You may recall, you asked me if you could screenshot something. I said, I have two questions. How much has the class changed since then? Am I still in the slide? <laughs> <laughs> the, the class has changed a little bit. I wouldn't, not enough that you should take it again. Not at all like that. I am, um, I'll just stop right there and not get myself in trouble. Um, are you still in the slides? Yes, you are still in the slides. You are. There's um, uh, Malo and a couple other folks uh, were, were doing things during the course that turned out to feed in just perfectly to the last lab that we do in, in the class. Uh, there's, a, there's a question. It's one of those, uh, the last lab is one of these um, exploitable things where it, if you look at it, you're like, well, why do I care? Why would that even be a problem if you could exploit that? And the thing that Malo and friends were doing during the class showed it perfectly. Like, this is why. I was so happy. I was so happy to have that. <laughs> this is how much for the public enemy set. Uh, I recently got this. It's a uh, public enemy action figures. It's uh, directly from Ed Tassour, the guy that did this. If you have never read the, the history of hip hop, it's the graphic novel history of hip hop. It's fantastic. It's just so good. Uh, that set is priceless, uh, but you could get it from Ed Tassour for like 60 bucks. All right, Philip said, "I if I'm using a SaaS provider with loose cookie security at my domain, are there risk of abuse against other websites at my domain?" Um, so you're using a, so you have a service provider, and you don't like the way they're setting their cookies. Uh, that could make your sites more vulnerable. Yes, uh, depending on what your sites do and how you handle um, requests in there. So you you can defend against cross site request forgery without. Um, any special settings on the cookies by having that unpredictable parameter be part of the, the submission. The, the easiest conceptual way to do that, uh, not the best way overall, but the easiest way to do that in concept is to take the, the value in the session cookie or some other cookie that you set randomly and make that value also a parameter that gets set. And then on the server, all you have to do is make sure that that cookie's value and that parameter's value are the same. You don't have to keep track of what the values are that you had created. Uh, and that works because the attacker doesn't get to see what's in the cookie, no matter what. Uh, well, you got to set HTTP only on the cookie. Um, they, um, that's the conceptually easiest way to do it. So you can see where you're doing something to that request that would make it impossible for an attacker to guess what you're doing and get the right values. Um, but any kind of anti CSERF token would help with that. Most frameworks now have a good, reliable anti CSERF um, feature that you basically just turn on and use, and you don't have to worry about it. Uh, so if you are using a service provider and you think that they could do better with the cookies that they're setting, um, maybe your opportunity is to be more strict about how you handle sensitive transactions, like with that um, anti CSERF token. And I do want to make a request to the people who are interested in traveling and interested in joining us in Deadwood in South Dakota. Uh, join us for Wild West Hacking Fest in October, where we get a chance to talk with you instead of talking at you, where you get to ask these questions in person. And all of a sudden, it's like a QA, and a It's pre-show banter. It's all those things. We actually had like a pre-show banter thing at our uh at our booth where a person's like, I love pre-show banter. And I was like, we're doing it right now. <laughs> um, so it was a lot of fun. Uh, let's see. Is there a reasonable value for Blue Teamer to take the full 16 hour modern web app course, potentially going to purple in the future? Uh, Blue Teamer depends on what which which part of the Blue Team you're on. If you're on like a, if you're a web developer, then yes, I think it would be valuable to see. If you're more on the network side of things, uh, the web app class I don't think is going to be uh, up your alley just yet, unless you want to get into testing web apps. Uh, Ross said, I may have missed it, but did you touch on using anti-CRSF tokens in request to somewhat mitigate the cross-site scripting approach? Uh, yes. Yeah. So the anti uh, the, the 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 thing is that unpredictable token that you add along with every request. Also, while you were doing the presentation, I was like, How, what, what cookies do we have on the Black Hills site? Like, uh, I was like, hmm. 
Uh, yeah, I'm the one that sees the Google Analytics to see which you know blogs people take a look at to see which webcast we should do and we should do it. Uh, other than that, we don't we hate tracking information because that means we actually have to do something with it, and so we don't do anything with it. Well, that, that's a, a great uh, example of where you, where you have trade-offs here. Like this is not, there's not an answer here that everybody yeah. should do things in a certain way. We, we want to be able to keep track of some things and we want to not keep track of other things. So, uh, so the advice is not that you should always set none, uh, or I'm sorry, set strict on all of your cookies anymore. You should do that on your sensitive ones, but you got you to understand what's going on, which is why I started where I did. Understand mm-hmm. what's going on, make the decisions that work for your system and, and your risk appetite. Yeah. Uh, what if during a pen test, there was no anti-CRS, CSRF token, but there are tons, 30 plus of other parameters that the values vary that an attacker can't guess them all, but they are predictable. Would you still report it as a CSRF vulnerability? I, I uh, Reporting it, it would be I wouldn't make that decision right then. What I would do is I would I would try to actually predict those things. So if there are a bunch of tokens in there and there's some pattern to them, I would try to figure out that pattern. Um, and never forget that if you're exploiting a CSERF vulnerability, that means that you have a web page that you're trying to get people to come visit. Uh, so you can do anything you want on that page. So you don't have to be right on your first guess. You can make hundreds of guesses automated all at once or in rapid succession. And if any one of them works, you win. And there's no penalty for getting it wrong. So that's where I would go. First, can I figure out how these things are generated? Is it a timestamp? Is it like an ascending integer? Is there some pattern? And then uh, try to write a script that would iterate through possible values for those things as quickly as possible while watching to see if if any of those worked. Yeah, I finally realized you're calling it CSERF. And yeah, it's like see, hmm. SRF, yes, not not the board in the water, yeah, the, not like the sign. Okay, right. Uh, I have a I have a specific interest in web app header exploits, but as a part of my role, I do not I do interact with web apps from a vuln management perspective. Well, I think that was back to the question of being a blue teamer ah, and okay. taking the class. Says so I have a specific interest in web app header exploits, but as a part of my role, I do interact with web apps from a vulnerability management perspective. I see. So in, in the class, uh, we don't look at headers specifically. Um, I mean, well, we do, but it's kind of incidental to the labs that we're working on. Um, some of the, the header attacks that are that are common out there are things when you translate between HTTP 1.1 and HTTP 2. Um, the translation between those things sometimes gets uh, squirrely. There's uh, There's Two different ways you can say how much more content is coming. There's transfer encoding and there's content length. And the spec says you can only have one. But what happens if you put them both in there? Um, that's an interesting attack that has to do with uh, request headers. Um, the Port Swigger Labs has great demonstrations of that, a great illustration or, or doc, or, sorry, great uh, descriptions of how that becomes a problem. And then they have free labs that you can do to exploit it on their site um, directly and see how it actually works. Uh, but we don't cover that. We don't get into, into that much uh, detail in the class. Uh, any thoughts on WordPress plugin, WordFence? Does it make your job harder? I have not run into WordFence yet. I don't know what that does. So no, it hasn't made my job harder yet. It might when I get to it. Mm-hmm. I'll have to write that down and see what that's about. Someone said, uh, do you have a link for the C-Surf for dummies? Um. Do I have a link? I do not. Um, let me see if I can find one though. Uh, well, I, I would go to go to the Portsburger Labs. Portsburger Labs is going to have a, an overview, and then they'll have ways to uh, to actually practice exploiting it uh, live as you go. So portsburger.com. Look for their academy. It's called the Portsburger Academy. Uh, that's that's my recommendation for anybody who wants to just you know get their feet wet and see if they want to do web app testing. Go there. Lots of free labs. You can see if you like it or not, um, and it's a great place to start. I actually I send um, testers there all the time. I go there myself to to try to get better at things. So it's not all just introductory. It's a great place to get better from zero or from wherever you're at. Uh, from anonymous it said, is it a bad idea? to allow cookies plus bearer tokens for authentication? Uh, so, so a cookie and an authentication header that has a bearer token in it. Um, you should pick which one you're going to use. Uh, the, um, there is this, this principle that helped the internet get 
built uh, called the, the robustness principle or the post, I think it's Postrel's principle, which is to be uh, strict in what you emit and liberal in what you accept. So that means that if you're creating an HTML document, it should validate. Uh, it means if you are authenticating to something, you should pick one or the other to do. Um, but if you're accepting something, if you if you receive an HTML document that's malformed, maybe you should try to make sense of it and do the best you can with it. Uh, maybe if you receive an authentication request that contains two different authentication tokens and one of them fails, maybe try the other one and see if that works. Um, it's great for interoperability, but it's horrible for security. Uh, you don't want to make guesses. You don't want to take a request that looks suspicious and make it okay. If it looks suspicious, you should just drop it. Uh, so having an authentication token in more than one place is a form of suspicious to me. Uh, it sounds like um, there's something going on in the coding there that's not taking into account all possibilities. Uh, it just seems ripe for exploitation there. I would pick one or the other. Yeah, the way I, I think I finally understood what a vulnerability was, was in the code, if it said if, and then wasn't certain, there is a possibility for vulnerability. So if yeah. then, if then could be something else, then, then at that point you could stick your own then in there. Yes. It, it's kind of like that. Yes. If, if, uh, you know, if, if I, if Jason's identification checks out, that's great. There should be no then. Uh, if, if, uh, you know, if, if that doesn't work, well then, you know, I'll ask the person he's with, is that really Jason? That, eh, that's not so great. You want the one, the one solid way of doing it. Mm -hmm. See if there's any more questions. Uh, what are some common CSERF generator implementations that are easy to break should be avoided? Oh boy, wouldn't that be great? Um, <laughs> the the ones that I come across are all pretty solid. There, there's there's some built into uh, .NET. There's some built into like the Python frameworks and the the uh, JavaScript server side frameworks. Um, I don't know of one uh, that is like reliably unreliable. Uh, the things I do to check, though, are uh, check to make sure uh, a mistake that is more common than you might expect is um, accepting a request that should have an anti-CSRF token, but doesn't have one. So um, some, some logic says, if there's a token here, validate it. So don't send a token. Send in a null value for the token, omit the parameter whose name you know, the, and with, omit the whole thing and see if that works. Those are the most common bypasses I see is either just either send in a null value or send in no value at all for that whole parameter. Sometimes that will work. All right. So before we leave, I just wanted to remind everyone, we'd love to see you at Wallace Hackenfest in October. Please join yes. us in Deadwood, either virtually or in person. We'd love to see you. Uh, any final words before we wrap up, Brian? Wow, that was weird. BB, I just saw Brian. I was like, huh. They, they right. both they both work. It's the robustness yeah. principle. I yeah. answer both. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I hope it was interesting, and I, I hope you get the idea that that's um, digging in a little bit to see how things actually work is is really helpful, and it gives you a better understanding and makes you more flexible. So hopefully, I help you get there today with this, and um, that's what I try to do every time I get up to speak with you guys. So thanks for coming. I appreciate you spending some time with us, and I hope that it was useful for you. Thanks, BB. Thank you all for joining us today for this Black Hills Information Security webcast. We know that you have a lot of things that you do with your time, and we appreciate you giving some of your time to us today. We hope this was beneficial to you. And if you ever need a red team thread hunt, active sock, or any of the pen testing things that we do, you always know where to find us. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. See ya. All right, Ryan, or whoever, kill it. <laughs>